Good morning, high school. Beautiful day this morning to stand and worship in. Let's stand together. Here we go. Come on, let's get a worship on. Here we go. Power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service? Here we go. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Power, wonder work, and power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder work, and power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Power, power, wonder work, and power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder work, Precious blood of the Lamb. All right, church, here we go. Come on. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Lord, how we need your power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. This power. Power, wonder working in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Hey, Mayor, Miss Gilbert, up this morning. Here we go. You may be seated. Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 7, says, For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I'm bringing them from the north country, and I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth, and among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and she who is in labor with child, together, a great company, they will return here. With weeping they will come, and by supplication I will lead them, and I will make them walk by streams of waters, on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim, God's people, us today, is my firstborn. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we sing aloud today with gladness, with passion, with excitement, because there is power in the blood of Jesus. And we, we come today, Lord, to proclaim, to praise, to celebrate our God who has led us from the darkness, led us from the outskirts, led us from the wilderness along streams of water into the goodness of your grace. I pray, Lord, as we worship this morning that it, we would get a sense of your majesty of your power and that we would walk forth from this building today that we would go forth from our time in worship today knowing that we have the power of the living God within us and through that we can run this race I pray that you would show us that this morning it's in your name we pray Lord Jesus amen what up, y'all? 
Good to have you here with us uh, at Hyattsville Baptist Church this morning. It's the finale of our fall revival here in 2021, and we are glad you're with us. Whether you're here on campus or you're joining us at a distance on the radio or on Facebook Live, hello and a special welcome to y'all as well. Uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better here at Hyattsville Baptist Church, and so to do that, if you're on campus, we've got a bulletin you should have got on your way in, although we might have run out of them. I'm not totally sure, but if you did, there's a little tear-off section on there. You can fill that out, drop it in the offering boxes at the back of the worship center, and we'll be able to get in touch with you that way. It's actually Mike, our guest preacher today, who uh, told me to call that the Great Baptist Ripoff. So uh, that's just one more thing I learned from Mike James, for better or for worse. Y'all decide how that goes. If you're not with us on campus, that's okay. We are glad you're with us anyway. You can connect with us at Hyattsville Baptist Church. Go to the Connect tab. Fill out the form there. It'll send us an email with all your information and how we can get in touch with you there. Additionally, if you're on Facebook specifically, hop in the comments. Tell us hello, where you're from today, and we would love to talk to you and help you connect with us through Facebook as well. We've got children's bulletins available in the main lobby back there. We believe in free-range families here at High School Baptist Church. I know we've got a lot of kids running around. Uh, we've got children's bulletins with crayons available that connect to the sermon material today. Additionally, we'll have Children's Church dismissed here in just a little while for anyone in second grade or below. And so I'll make sure that's clear when that time comes. But we're excited to have you here with us. No matter who you are, where you're from, or how old you are, we're ready to worship this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's get after it. Just want to set the record straight uh, this morning. I've had several people ask me, and so I just want to publicly say, um, no, Joe, JJ did not cold cock me uh, last night. Uh, I've got some serious things going on with my eyeballs, but she did not hit me, not that I recall anyway. Um, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it, and we're going to be okay. Uh, I can't read very well. I can't see very well. So if I mess up the words, just keep on trucking, and we'll, uh, we'll keep on going. But, man, we're stoked to have you here. Great, uh, great audience this morning, great congregation. So uh, we're looking forward to what God's going to do uh, in our service this morning. Let's stand together. We're going to open up with praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Here we go. <clears throat> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In his arms he carries him all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals let with those and his ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Revelation 4, starting with verse 8, says this. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. You getting a the theme forever and ever? They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Here we go. Let's worship together. Amen. Uh -huh. 
just yesterday and today but you reign eternally as it says in Revelation forever and ever and ever Father we thank you for the power that you have the, the ownership of us we thank you that we are your kids even though we don't deserve it and Father this morning, we honor you as our Lord and our Savior, our King, our Redeemer, our Alpha, our Omega. Thank you for the great week that we've had together as a church. We invite you to a place of honor right here in our sanctuary, in our worship service. Father, may your spirit move throughout the pews this morning. And above all, whatever sung, said, preached, prayed will bring honor and glory to you in Christ's name that we pray amen you may be seated
And it is at this time we want to go ahead and dismiss for Children's Church. So everybody second grade and down may head on out and go to Children's Church at this time. As our kids head out, uh, just a couple things to keep you in the know. Uh, one, it is the finale of our fall revival. And like Dan was just praying a minute ago, it's been a good week. Amen. It, uh, it has been just an absolute joy uh, to be worshiping with y'all each and every night for the last few nights. And uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I know that. And so uh, here in just a minute, my, my friend, my mentor, my pastor, Mike James, is going to come up and share one last sermon with us. I'm excited to be able to have him here on Sunday morning today. Uh, but, but that's not all, folks. If I had... Uh, if I had Porky the pig here, he'd, he'd probably stutter as he said that. But we've got even more after our sermon today. Uh, we're going to have a chili cook-off I'm about to lose because I hear tell Annie, Annie Tilly's got a 50-year-old chili recipe she's going to beat me with. So I know I'm not beating that. So I'm, I'm at least losing to Miss Annie and probably a bunch of the rest of y'all. Uh, but we're going to have some chili, some soups, some sandwiches, some desserts here in the fellowship hall right after worship. We invite everybody to please stay eat with us let's have some time together and then we'll also have some hay rides going on for for the kids and the kids at heart to hop on there as long as the rain holds out which a minute ago it was only raining on me and ronnie van hook there was sun everywhere and then just me and ronnie van hook were getting rained on and i don't know which one of us was drawing the the rain there but just stay away from us on the hay ride and we'll be good and so uh, looking forward to that here in just a few minutes that's not the only thing we've got this week though believe it or not this coming Wednesday is our trunk or treat, uh, starting at 6:45. Uh, I've been told by the children's team to let y'all know that if you're a volunteer or if you have a trunk that you're providing, uh, please get here no later than 6:30 on Wednesday, just to make sure everybody's in place before kids start showing up. So if you are volunteering, having a trunk, whatever for trunk or treat, please be here by at least 6.30, earlier if possible, just to make sure we're all in place and got it together for the, the trunk or treat to start in earnest at 6.45. It'll go till 8 this Wednesday night. We're going to have candy, hot dogs, inflatables, cotton candy, popcorn. It's going to be a good time. I know that we could still use a few helpers in different areas. Uh, if you would like more information about that, be sure to talk to someone on the kids team. My wife, Brittany, is back there on the camera. She would love to help you get connected with that. Just talk to her after service, and she'll let you know where the holes might be. Uh, so that way we can have everything uh, running as smoothly as possible on Wednesday night. We are looking forward to that. We're also looking forward to the launch of a new community group next Sunday morning uh, on Halloween. Uh, we're launching a new community group. Uh, it'll be meeting back here in the room right beside the nursery. And so uh, looking forward to that. That'll kick off at 9.15 next Sunday morning. Uh, look forward to, to seeing just what the Lord is going to do. You know, a growing church is a, gro is a church that is growing in the number of community groups and small group ministries. That is statistically always the case so every time we're starting new groups that's a sign that the lord is moving in new and different ways within our body and that's a thing to celebrate one last announcement before dan comes up and leads us in one more song uh, we are collecting food right now for our thanksgiving food baskets and so that is right around the corner i know it may be hard to believe that thanksgiving is coming right up but it certainly is uh, we absolutely this month are in need of boxes of Jiffy Mix and Brownie Mix, uh, but there are a number of other needs as well. Uh, if you want to talk more about that, Evelyn White there in the back. Evelyn, can you just kind of wave for those who may not know you? She oversees this ministry with a lot of help from others, but if you go talk to her, she'll be able to tell you everything that we need for our food baskets. That way we're good to go. This is a ministry that feeds quite a few families in our community each and every year. It's a great blessing to, to be a part of that. And so if you would like to know more about it, please talk to Evelyn at the conclusion of our service. And so with that, let's keep on worshiping. I went back to the, the booth and... Uh, we were listening to Ryan talk about the Brian talk about uh, rain falling on he and Ronnie Van Hook, 
and Eddie leaned over and whispered in my ear, Matthew 5.45. If all you don't know what Matthew 5.45 says, it says that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the ground, and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. <laughs> so you will make up your mind which one is the two there, so... Good job, Betty. is up to you will you be the one to answer to his call and will you stand when those around you fall will you be the one to take his light into a darkened Tell me, will you be the one? Oh, sometimes it's so hard to know who is right and what is wrong. Where are you supposed to stand when the battle lines are drawn? There's a voice that keeps calling out for someone who's not afraid to be a beacon in the night to a world who's lost its way. Will you be the one to answer to his call? And will you stand when those around you fall? Will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world Tell me, will you be the one? And if the Lord provides the power For you to stand and say Yes, I'll be the one To answer to His call I will stand when those around me fall. I will be the one to take his light into a darkened world. Will you be the one? I will be the one. 
Thank you, Dan. You know, that's when revival happens, when you and I realize we're the one. It's not the person sitting behind you or beside you or in front of you, but when we know the Lord's talking to me today, not to my brother or my sister or my wife or husband, but to me. Thank you for that. What a joy it's been to be with you and appreciate Brian inviting me. And I want you to pray for me because I've been praying about this a lot last night. I plan to eat some of Brian's chili. And I did bring two bottles of Pepto-Bismol with me just in case there's a problem. And so if you want me to share that with you, uh, I will be glad <laughs> to do it. But it's been a great time to be with you Wednesday through this week. And again, thank you for, thank you for inviting me so much. Uh, Fr Fred and his wife Martha were just simple folks. And they really enjoyed going to the state fair every year. And uh, when, when Fred saw the, uh, the antique biplane, he said to his wife, Martha, he said, you know, I would love to ride in that airplane. I've never ridden in an airplane my whole life. And Martha replied, I know, Fred, but that airplane ride costs $10, and $10 is $10. And one year, Fred and Martha went to the fair. They went every year, and this would always happen. He would want to ride it, and she would say, well, $10 is $10. And one year, Fred and Martha went, and Fred said, Martha, I'm 81 years old. If I'm ever going to ride in an airplane, I may not ever get another chance. And Martha replied, well, Fred, that airplane ride is $10, and $10 is $10. Well, uh, the pilot that was flying this, this plane heard them, and he said, well, folks, I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll take you both up for a ride, and if you stay quiet for the entire ride and not say one word, I won't charge you anything. It'll be free. So Fred and Martha thought, well, that's a good deal. So they got on this, this plane. The pilot went up, and he did all types of loops and swirls and all types of rolls and dives, and there was not a word said. He did all the tricks again. Still not a word said. Well, when they were landing, the pilot turned to Fred and said, by golly, I, I did everything I could to get you to, to say something, but you didn't. And Fred replied, he said, well, I was going to say something when Martha fell out, but $10 is $10. <laughs> and so that kind of, <laughs> you know, I heard about a pastor, and by the way, you have a great pastor. You know, Brian just needs a little bit more enthusiasm, doesn't he? <laughs> When he came up here, he said, what's up? I said, uh, Brian, do you spell that W-A-T-T-S, like that's your last name? You know? But anyway, that's a, another joke. But anyway, I heard about a pastor that was somewhat humor impaired. He just, he, he just, to be honest, he was boring. And he couldn't tell a joke. And he went to a pastor's conference to learn how to, to preach better. And Brian and I go to those. We're always trying to hone our craft and do a better job for the Lord. And he went to this conference. And sure enough, there was a breakout session on how to use humor in your preaching. And so he was at that, uh, at that session. And the presenter uh, was a well-known speaker. And uh, he came out. And the first thing he said was this. He said, I have a confession to make this morning. He said, uh, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of a woman that wasn't my wife. Well, all those pastors hearing that like, oh, and 15 seconds goes by, 30 seconds goes by, and then he followed up by saying, and that woman was my dear mother. Well, everybody kind of laughed about that. So the next week, this pastor who was somewhat humor impaired thought, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that joke. So he worked on it and memorized it, got up to his podium, and he says, Folks, I have a confession to make to you this morning. Some of the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another woman who wasn't my wife. Well, his congregation just gapped. And you could just hear it. There wasn't a sound. They 15 seconds goes by, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes. And he thought, what is the second part of this joke? <laughs> he just, so he started again. He said, folks, uh, I've got a confession to make. Uh, some of the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another woman who wasn't my wife. And for the life of me, I can't think of who she was. <laughs> and so <laughs> you can... <laughs> You can get in a lot of trouble if you don't remember the punchlines, that's for sure. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bumps. i got to tell you, laughter is really needed today. Amen? We've been through a terrible pandemic, and uh, 
uh, we need to laugh some and enjoy our relationship with the Lord and know it's going to get better. Amen. Uh, I want to share with you this morning. You've got an outline if you want to use that. Um, four biblical principles that we really need to know in order to run our race for Jesus and finish strong. I got a word for everyone here this morning who is a follower of Christ, and here it is. Jesus wants you to finish your race strong. When you read the Bible, you will find a lot of people in the Bible that didn't finish their race strong, but Jesus wants us to. You see, not everyone who grows old grows up. Your age, your chronological age, doesn't necessarily show you're a mature person. I, got, I know a lot of people in their 40s and 50s that are doing idiotic things. Just pick up the paper. Uh, age does not equate with growing up. Not everyone who grows old grows up. God wants you to grow up and mature in your faith. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 has been one of my favorite passages my entire life. And you know these verses. And I, if you don't mind, let's stand in honor of God's word. Let me just read these three verses to you, and we're going to jump in this text real quick. Listen to it. You have it on the screen. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us, uh, with endurance, run the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Father God, I pray that today your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us. Father, I pray for anyone here that's maybe just going through some tough times, that they will look to you for the next step they need to take. And Lord, anyone here that's never professed Christ as Savior and Lord, this might be the day where they make that all-important decision of following you. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be, you can be seated. As followers of Christ, you and I are in a race. It's not a foot race. It's a faith race. When this letter was written, uh, some of these Hebrew Christians were tempted to drop out of the race because there was great persecution going on. Many of them had been making sinful choices and there just was a lot of apathy going on. We still face those same obstacles today. But the Bible says to these believers and to us, listen, keep on running. Don't stop. You can finish. And then he gives us some encouragement to keep us going. We all need encouragement, particularly in what we've been through in recent months. My guess is some of you here today have slowed down in your race for Christ. Maybe you're experiencing burnout. Maybe, uh, maybe you just have made some really bad choices in your life recently. Maybe you're just apathetic. Maybe, uh, maybe you're lukewarm in your faith right now. Let these verses challenge you to keep on keeping on and again, uh, regain your passion for Christ. I want you to help me this morning a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to a couple of times, I'm, when I say this, I want you to repeat. I'm going to say, get it. And you say, got it. And then I'm going to say, good. Just to make sure that, you know, half of you don't go to sleep this morning, okay? All right, so let's practice. Get it. Good. Try it one more time. Get it. Good. Okay, well, hang with me here. We're going to rock and roll through here. Notice now. These four principles. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we, not me, not I, but since we, notice it's not me or we, we run the faith race together. Get it? Good. God provides other people to encourage us, and that's why God thought of this whole idea of the church, the ecclesia, where we could come together and worship and grow and be in a small community group and share God's Word. That's what it's all about. And there, there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. You know, even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. Remember Tonto? Some of you have to Google that because you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but even the Lone Ranger had a friend named Tonto. In the body of Christ, the church, listen, we work together. We serve together. We give our tithes and offerings together. We sacrifice. We pray. We visit. We weep together. We laugh together. 
Now, don't be surprised by this, but sometimes Baptists don't agree with each other. You ever been to a Baptist business meeting? <laughs> anyway, I know you heard the story about the Baptist that was stranded on a desert island for 25 years, just by himself. And uh, we're at 25 years. Finally, a ship came by and someone saw some activity on the island. They sent a small boat over there to rescue this guy. And they said, we can't believe you've lived here. He told them, 25 years by myself. And they said, well, we, we'll, we'll rescue you and get you back on the boat. And this Baptist said, well, w would you like to, like to see my, my little island here I've been on for 25 years by myself? They said, yeah. And they noticed three, uh, three buildings in the distance. And they said, what are those? He said, well, that first building there, that's my house. I built, I've been living in that hut I built for the last 25 years by myself. They said, what's that second building? He says, that's where I go to church. I've just been going to church there by myself the last 25 years. They said, what's that third building? He said, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> you know, we laugh about that, but that describes a lot of us, doesn't it? It really does. It really does. Well, look at this. It says, therefore. When you see a therefore in Scripture, you should immediately stop yourself and say, what's that therefore? And the therefore is there because the word therefore in chapter 12 connects this whole chapter back to chapter 11. It points us back to what's written there. Hebrews 11 is God's hall of fame. It's God's hall of fame. It's just such a great chapter. It lists all the spiritual champions of the Old Testament. Men and women and youth who ran their race and stood up for God in their generation and made an impact. Now, the key to how all these men and women were successful is wrapped up in one short phrase that's connected with every one of these names, and that phrase is by. By faith, Abel. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. By faith, uh, Rahab. Verse 1 refers to them as a great cloud of witnesses. These people are the heroes of our faith. Now, the word witnesses... Uh, does not mean spectators. In the church today, I'm afraid we have far too many spectators and not enough people in the game. Vance Havner said a long time ago, he says, we've got too much of the world in the church and not enough of the church in the world. Somebody say amen. amen. That's exactly our problem today. And uh, following Jesus is not for spectators. Now, the Greek word and our English word for martyr means witness it's the same word and for some of these early followers of christ their witness cost them their life you know that's true today in many parts of the world today christians are being martyred like like no time i think of afghanistan the christians that are there and and what they're facing right now now these people are not witnessing what we're doing rather they're bearing witness to us that god can and god will see us through just like he did for them when they ran their race we remember their example and what they endured and how they ran their race, and that really encourages us. Now, these faithful people from the past now stand in Hebrew stuff like a, like, a, like a cloud of witnesses, kind of like a great amphitheater with rows and rows and rows of people that have ran their race in that great cloud. By the way, we're not the first Christians to struggle with problems. We're not the first Christians to go through a pandemic. We're not the first Christians to face addictions and discouragement and failures. Others have run the race and worked through their difficulties and crossed the finish line for the glory of God, and you can too. The message here is to follow their example and stay faithful to Christ as you run your race. Now today, this cloud of witnesses is larger. I think about some of the uh, folks in the New Testament the Apostle John and Mark and Paul, Timothy. I think throughout church history, Martin Luther, Calvin. I think of family members that, that I have lost that are already in that cloud of witnesses. I think of some of my mentors, Dr. John Carter and Al Giesler and other believers that poured into me. And you can think of those people, a mom, a godly mom and dad, maybe a, maybe a coach, a Sunday school teacher. Can you think right now of a person that's in that cloud of witnesses that has gone on, that made an impact on your life. They ran their race, now we must run ours. They had a course set out for their lives, and we do too. Listen, folks, how are you doing? How are you doing in your faith race this morning 
for Jesus. Have you slowed down? Have you fallen on the track? Listen, you need to get back up and get back in the race. Notice the phrase there, since we. This whole passage is addressed to followers of Christ, to believers. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, this verse probably doesn't make any sense to you at all. But you can change that today by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. You accept what He did on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Repent of your sins. Confess Him. Ask Him to come into your life and change your life, and He'll do it like that. And your life will be on a different tra trajectory for the rest of your life. I hope some of you do that today. Get on God's team. What is our response to these heroes of the faith in chapter 11? Well, we need to do two things. We need to be faithful ourselves. And secondly, we need to realize we're always building on the work and the faithfulness of somebody else. You know that, don't you? You know, one of the, I, I never judge a revival when I preach a revival or when I preach on Sunday mornings at some church. Uh, God, it's, that's, you know, we preach and we share the message that is up to God and the Holy Spirit and you to respond. But one of the benefits of revival is to see more faithfulness after. I hope that, I hope that Brian and your church sees more faithfulness from the congregation in the days ahead. That's one sign that we listen to what God was saying to us. But we're always building on the work and faithfulness of other people. Someday, listen, someday other people will build on our work and our faith. It's like the saying, when you see a turtle on a fence post, you can write it down. Somebody helped that little guy get up there. He didn't do it on his own, right? And we all need help from time to time. I heard about a college professor, and uh, he would often bring his uh, five, four-year-old son with him. Uh, and you, they would, people would see walking down through the campus his little four-year-old son. That was, uh, it, a lot of people saw him do that. He would bring his son often with him to the campus. But one day the college professor was, was a little bit behind in his schedule. He had to get to his class to teach. So he took his little four-year-old boy and he set him on his shoulders. And they were walking down through campus really fast. And one of the, his fellow professors saw him and looked up at the little boy and said, My, my, you have grown so tall since I last saw you. And the little four-year-old boy looked down at the professor and said, and he said, Not all of this is me. <laughs> Folks, I thought about that a lot, and I want you to know something. By the grace of God, all of us stand on someone else's shoulders this morning. Today, this is not all me. I think about Miss Whitaker who taught me in youth Sunday school and uh, who knew more about the Bible than any seminary professor I ever had. She read through the Bible so many times every year. She was about this tall and she was about that wide and uh, she loved me. She taught me a love for God's Word and early in my life told me, she said, Mike, I think God's going to call you into ministry. Now nobody in my family was in ministry. Again, my last name is James, Frank, Jesse. We rob banks. Okay, we don't preach. And, uh, but she saw something in me really as like a 13, 14 year old kid. I didn't see in myself. She made a huge impact in my life. A lady, I did her funeral, Miss Carter, I did her funeral three months ago. Miss Carter prayed for me every day for over 40 years. And she was 95. And when I did her funeral, I'm telling you, uh, it was hard because I knew I had lost someone that made such a huge impact in my life for praying for me all those years like that. I'm standing on her shoulders. Paul Lawson, the pastor that I was saved under and baptized. Uh, so many people I could name. My grandmother who, who gave me money from her Social Security check so I could go to college. I'm telling you folks, when you see me, you don't see everything that's here. A lot of people have blessed me and poured into me. You don't see my wife praying for me hours and hours as I teach and preach. Folks, when I look at you, you know what? I don't see everything. I know behind your heart are people who have made an impact on your life, and that's made a difference. We're all standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us and invested in us. Here's a question i got to ask you. Who are you investing in? Who are you investing in? I don't care what age you are, you can invest in someone else. 
You can pray with someone, encourage someone, maybe be, be a mentor to someone. Who are you investing in today? You know, sometimes we get a little prideful. We think, well, you know, where I'm at in, in life right now, you know, I did it all myself. You know, I'm a self-made man. You know, when Muhammad Ali was in his prime, um, he was getting ready to take off on an airplane. You know how brash, if you remember, Muhammad Ali was. And he was getting ready to take off on an airplane. And a flight attendant reminded him, uh, sir, you need to fasten your seatbelt. And, and he came back really brashly. He said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the flight attendant said, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> so, <laughs> Muhammad Ali fastened his seatbelt. That's the way we are sometimes. That's the way we are. Listen, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, they will build on your faith. We do church together. That's God's way. Get it? Good. The second thing here, it says, lay aside every encumbrance. Throw off. Today we would say, just, just jettison. Uh, the, the, I want to challenge you to examine your heart and get rid, rid of the encumbrances that slow you down in your race for Christ. You have them. I have them. Uh, sometimes you get a blank piece of paper in your quiet time and say, Lord, tell me right now some things I need to change in my life. Point out to me, Lord, in my heart through your Holy Spirit some sins. You might want to have a big pad of paper. And a, and a couple of ballpoint pens, because if you're honest with God, He'll show you real quickly some things in your life that need to change. If you ask Him that right now, He will show you the encumbrances that need to change. You know, we're, we're, we're carrying too much stuff sometimes, and, and uh, much more than God intended. Uh, sometimes we become weighed down with the concerns of the world. Some of us need to learn that less is more. If you can declutter any part of your life and simplify any part of your life, you ought to do it. It says lay aside every encumbrance, every one, not, not just one or two, but all of them. Those who ran in the Olympic races would throw aside everything that might slow them down. And as Christians today, we're bound for heaven, and we need to throw aside everything that might slow us down in our faith race for Christ. You know, athletes often wear training weights to help them prepare for events. But no athlete in their right mind would, would keep those weights on when they're running in a race. Uh, I remember so vividly, I was home from college in 1972, and I watched Frank Shorter, the last American to win the Olympic marathon. And, uh, and he won it that year. And uh, last time we had an American win it, to be honest. But I remember they showed... Frank Shorter, before this 26-mile race, he did something weird. He had a very expensive pair of running shoes, and he took a razor blade, and he was shaving off little tiny bits of the sole of his shoe. And he calculated if he could just shave off, shave off one-eighth ounce from each shoe, he had it figured out how many pounds of weight that would be over a 26-mile run. And that's the idea here. Throw that off. You see, encumbrances and weights are anything that hinders our spiritual growth. If I ask you what's slowing you down in your spiritual growth, right now your answer would be an encumbrance. Okay, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe you, you don't, you've not been in the Word of God lately. You know, your, your Bible's pretty dusty at home. You don't even bring it to church, you know. You don't read it. Maybe you, you just become very rude to people, even maybe people in your own under your own roof. Maybe you've got a besetting sin. Maybe your language is not befitting for a believer when you're at school or at work. And then he says, get rid of the sin that so easily entangles us. You know, sin has a way of tripping us up, doesn't it? Sin easily entangles us, and before we know it, we're tripped up and fallen on the track. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't mention any specific sin here. Maybe, maybe he's referring to one of our biggest sins, which I think, and that's just unbelief. It was unbelief that kept Israel out of the promised land. It's unbelief that stops us from experiencing all that God wants us to experience individually and as a church. You know, we miss so many of God's blessings because of our lack of faith, which is unbelief. You know what I keep you from being all that Christ desires for you to be? It's unbelief. It's not having the faith that you need. The opposite of unbelief is faith. The, faith. the phrase by faith is used 26 times in Hebrews 11, showing us that faith in Christ is what empowers us to endure and to keep on going and to finish strong. Faith replaces 
unbelief. You know the Bible says, you, you know this, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, and, and we know that God's going to provide for all I need. You know, sometimes I have people ask me, Mike, how can, I, how can I please God? Is there something I can do to please God today, tomorrow? Let me tell you how you can please God. It's pretty simple. In Hebrews 11, chapter 6, says this, And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. You want to please God today? Okay. Have faith. Put all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And the scripture says you will please God. Are you living by faith? What is slowing you down from following Christ and being the best teacher, the best deacon, the best Hyattsville church member you can be, the best mom or dad, the best grandparent you can be? What's slowing you down? Sin easily entangles us. Sin addicts us. The devil wants to see your life and my life filled, listen, with addictions. And i got to tell you, he's doing a pretty good job in our day. It's amazing how many addictions people have today. Some people are addicted to, to food, to work, to social media. Some people are uh, addicted to unhealthy relationships, to alcohol, to drugs, to pornography. I heard about a man years ago that was admitted to Bellevue Hospital in New York City. His throat had been slashed, and he died three days after he was admitted to the hospital at the age of 37 years old. He had 38 cents in his pocket when he died. The death blow was not self-inflicted, nor was it administered by someone else. It was a bizarre accident. You see, this guy was drunk, and he was an alcoholic, and he was staggering around in his room in the slums of New York and he apparently fell against the wash basin and when the wash basin fell and broke he uh, and shattered that wash basin he hit the floor and his throat was gashed by a piece of that broken basin when they found him he was he was naked he was unconscious he was hanging on by a thread he was transferred to the Bellevue hospital where he died still trying to sober up suffering from malnutrition just another bum on the streets of New York who died because of alcohol. But as it turned out, this was not just another bum. This was someone that you knew and someone that, that I knew about. His name was Stephen Foster, who once was probably America's uh, uh, most popular songwriters, Camp Town Races, Old Susanna, a genie with a light brown hair, and of course he wrote My Old Kentucky Home, and hundreds more. But now his success was behind him. The acclaim he had received from an admiring public was gone and forgotten. And Stephen Foster died a broken man in poverty, addicted. Listen to me, folks. It may be old-fashioned to preach against sin, but I want to tell you, sin will kill you. Sin will kill you. And all of us here could share of some friends that we had that got addicted to something or did something because of a sinful habit who are not here anymore because they died. Sin will kill you. The good news I want to announce to you this morning is Jesus wants to set you free. That's the power of the gospel. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Not Satan's lies, but God's truth. You see, the devil gives his best shot first, and then he saves the worst for last. Listen, never tell your kids that sin is not fun. The Bible says sin is fun for a season. Sin is fun for a season, but then there's a payback. You see, the devil gives us, our, again, our first, uh, sh the greatest shot first, and then there's this law of diminishing returns. It, it takes more drugs to feel that high you originally have. And so it gets worse and worse and worse. But God gives us His grace that we talked about last night and His mercy, and it just keeps getting better and better. It doesn't get less and less. And those of you who have been walking with the Lord for a decade, you know this is true. Doesn't it get better and better? It doesn't get worse. It gets better. So let go. Let go of the sin that will not let go of you. What's your greatest spiritual challenge this morning? 
What's keeping you from experiencing revival? Remember Acts 3.19, the verse I've asked you to memorize? Repent and return so that your sins will be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Or have you been experiencing some times of refreshing with the Lord? Listen, ask God to forgive you and cleanse you. Confess your sin. Get it? Good. We run the faith race together. We lay aside every weight and sin. And thirdly, let us run with endurance. One thing that runs through this chapter is endurance or perseverance. The word endure means to bear up under trial, to continue when the going gets really tough. These Christians were going through a time of testing, and they were tempted to give up. You know, we must have that same type of endurance for the race that is before us. It's a lifetime commitment. Listen, don't fizzle out. Someone said, a faith that fizzles before the finish had a fatal flaw from the first. Try saying that real fast. A faith that fizzles before the finish had a fatal flaw from the first. Let me remind you, church, the Christian life is a marathon, not a sprint. Some people don't get that. And you've seen this when someone maybe comes and joins a church and they're so excited for two months. And then all of a sudden we can't find them. Part of that may be our fault for not plugging them into a, a small group and discipling them. But listen, the Christian life is a marathon not a sprint. It's the long haul. And we need to realize that. You know what the hardest part of anything is? Starting. That's the hardest part of a diet. That's the hardest part of exercise. Just, you know, going out your front door and, and doing it. The hardest part of anything is starting. Maybe God is telling many of us this morning, start. Make the changes that I've convicted you of and start now. Run the race that is set before us. Listen, you've got a course to run. God has a plan for your life. It's different. It's different than mine. I, listen, I can't run your race. You can't run mine. But together, we can run our race for Jesus Christ and for the glory of God. Get it? Good. One last thing here, and then I'm done. This verse says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Success in life, I've noticed, has a lot to do with where we focus. Now, young people, I want you to listen to a minute. You want to be successful in life or school, it's a matter of keeping your eyes on the main thing. Focus. You know, showing up is about 80% of success. Just showing up for class. Showing up for work. Focus. Whether that's school or sports or business or in your Christian life. Focus on Jesus. This passage doesn't say keep your eyes fixed on your pastor. Keep your eyes fixed on your Sunday school teacher, your spouse, your children, yourself. Don't fix your eyes on anyone else, just Jesus. Don't let the little things bother you. Focus on Jesus. Don't let the big things bother you. Focus on Jesus. You see, what we see, what we focus on, we desire and are drawn to. Let me give you some bad examples. Your neighbor gets a new car, and you're envious, and you look at it. It's shiny. Yours is beat all up, about to fall apart. And you become uh, envious of that new car. You look at it and think, man, I, I don't understand how they got a new car and, and I don't. You know, that's, that's one. Uh, or looking at pornography, or desiring sinful things, coveting something. A good example is seeing the needs in someone's life and providing for that need and helping and sharing. Focus on Jesus. What you look at the most, you focus on, and it becomes your desire. Look at me. What are you focusing on lately? Have you been focusing on God's Word and worship and growing in your faith and serving your church or something else? What have you been focusing on? You know 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It's a great revival verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal, forgive their sin and heal their land. Seeking God's face is focus. I got a confession to make to you this morning. I have never been in a cage full of lions. Maybe you have. 
I know you've been to the circus and you've seen this. It's kind of interesting. When the animal trainer is in a cage full of these lions, he usually has a, has a pistol and he has a whip, but he always carries into it, it's kind of weird, a stool. And I read about this recently, and if you've ever seen this, the lion tamer will take that stool, and usually the lions are sitting on like big tall stool, and they keep jabbing it in the lion's face. And the lion roars and kind of does his paw, looks like he's going to jump and eat the lion tamer up. But the more that the lion tam tamer kind of pushes this into their face, all of a sudden something happens. The lion tries to focus on all four of these legs coming at him at the same time, and he can't. Neither can you focus on four things like that at the same time. So something really strange happens. He becomes tame and, and weak and kind of mes mesmerized and powerless because he can't focus on all four of those things at the same time. And he just sits there and he gets docile and he gets still and powerless. Listen, today the devil is thrusting some things for you to focus on. And if you focus on those things, you too will become weak and tame and helpless. Don't do it. Focus on Jesus. Billy Graham once said, if you're not content with what you have, you will never be content with what you want. And that's right. Listen, we're not called to comfort. We're not called to convenience, but to commitment and conviction. Conviction from God's Word and the Holy Spirit. Since Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, if we trust in Him, He releases His power in us. As we meet Him in His Word and yield to His Holy Spirit, He increases our faith and He gives us the power to run the race each day with endurance, with faithfulness, with passion. Listen, church. Listen, church. If you forget everything I've said since Wednesday, just remember this. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus, and you'll be okay. You take your eyes off Him, you're in dangerous territory. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And that's what's really, really important. It was 7 p.m. on October the 20th, 1968. It was in Mexico City, the great Olympic stadium that was there, and that was the year the Olympics was in Mexico City. It was beginning to get dark. It had cooled down quite a bit, and the last of the Olympic marathon runners were being assisted away to first aid stations. Over an hour earlier, Mimbo Waldi of Ethiopia had charged across the finish line in that great stadium, having run 26 miles 385 yards. He looked as strong and vigorous as when he started the first mile. As a lot of people had left the stadium, a few thousand spectators were still there, and they all of a sudden heard police sirens and whistles through the gate at the stadium where the marathon runners had entered. And the, the attention turned to that first gate, and they saw a sole figure wearing the colors of Tanzania come into that sta stadium limping. He was limping. His name was John Stephen Aquari. He was the last man to finish the marathon race in the Olympics in 1968. His leg was bandaged and bloody. You see, he had taken a terrible fall earlier in the race, and they wrapped it up, and, but he kept going. He kept going. And it was all he could do just to limp around that track one step at a time. Well, the crowd saw that, and they thought, man. And they started standing up. And they started clapping and cheering for this guy as he made that last painful lap around the stadium. When he finally crossed the finish line, all the reporters got in his face and one asked him that, that question everybody was thinking. They were saying, listen, you're badly injured. Why didn't you quit? You had no chance of winning the race. You knew that. Why did you do this and go through so much pain? You had no chance of winning. And a quarry, this quiet, dignified man said this my country didn't send me 3,000 miles to start a race my country sent me to finish the race folks I believe the Lord is saying to a lot of us this morning you got to finish your race 
Don't slow down. Don't get off course. Focus on Jesus and finish the race. And that's the key, to stay focused on Him. We need to get our eyes off of ourselves, off of 24-hour news channels and other people and problems and pandemics and circumstances and get our eyes on Christ alone. Why? Scripture says here He's the perfecter of our faith. You see, faith begins with Jesus. I hope you've done that. I would think at a crowd this side, there's several of you who have never stepped across the line and accepted Jesus. Boy, what a good day to make that decision and let Jesus be the Lord of your life. It begins with Jesus, that's salvation. Our faith ends with Jesus, that's glorification when we get to heaven. But our faith continues with Jesus, that's right now. And that's called sanctification, growing in grace, living for Christ every day. One day our faith will be completed in Jesus. He's the starter and the finisher of our race. He's already run the race for us. He knows the course because he's done it. Get it? Good. Listen, one day, listen, one day we'll be in that cloud of witnesses. Don't you want to be there? Do you know some people that will not be in that cloud of witnesses because they don't know Jesus? And you've got a burden to share the gospel with them this should be our goal second timothy 4 7 i fought the good fight i have finished the race i have kept the faith that should be all of our goals as believers in jesus christ listen church run your race don't give up don't give in don't give out don't give out i see three decisions you can make as we enter a time of decision this morning you can give your life to Christ. That's salvation. That's the first step in the race. You've got to take it. Put your trust, your faith, your belief in Jesus Christ. If you take the first step from that pew, I'm telling you, the Lord will help you take the rest of the steps. You come and take Brian by the hand and say, you know, I want to begin this journey of following Christ. I want to repent of my sins. I want to start, and I want to be a believer. Secondly, maybe you want to come and rededicate your life to get back on track for God to repent of your sins so that you have this time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Regain your passion for the gospel. Some of you need to do that. And some of you might just need to come around the altar and pray for a lost person. Maybe someone that is in your circle of influence, maybe even under your same roof, who do not know Jesus. What will you do today with this message? Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for this encouraging passage of Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Father, you have called us to run the race with endurance. God, help us when we don't focus on you. Father, when we, when we do that, we've sinned. And God, I pray this morning, Lord, for anyone here today, Lord, right now your Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart about receiving you as Lord and Savior. May they, Lord, in the quietness of their heart right now, ask you, invite you, to come into their life, to be their Lord and Savior. And Father, for all of us who are believers, God, help us to finish the race strong, with passion, with endurance, with faith. Lord, bless this invitation. I pray that everybody here will respond and be obedient to what you've asked us to do. And I ask this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We're going to stand and sing. You come. If God has spoken to you about a decision on that first verse, you respond to whatever God is asking you to do as we sing. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Jesus, we love you we worship and adore you glorify 
thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify thy name in all the earth, glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify Amen. And, and like Mike said, the time for response doesn't end right here when we quit singing. Uh, I will be around right here after service. I would love to talk to you about any decision you might need to make. Maybe it is that rededication or that following Jesus for the first time. Maybe it's trusting the Lord in baptism or in church membership. Whatever it is, I would love to talk to you about it and how we can help you take the next step in your race. I know the, one of the next steps we're all about to take is we're about to head over to the Fellowship Hall and eat some chili and other uh, soups and sandwiches and whatnot. I'm looking forward to that. Just go ahead and head on over here in just a second, and we will uh, we'll get after that. Additionally, uh, I want to remind you that with the meal this afternoon, we will not have evening services tonight. And so y'all enjoy some time with your families this evening, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back this Wednesday for Trunk or Treat. Eddie Coffey, would you come and pray, not just to close our service, but also to, to go ahead and bless the meal for us as we head over there? Thank you, brother. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the gift of a beautiful day you've given us today. We're especially thankful, Lord, for all the folks who have taken the time out of the week to come to your house this morning to, uh, Lord, establish horizontal relationships with those uh, around them. And we're especially thankful for uh, Brother Mike, uh, Lord, as he brought the message all this week. And if you didn't get an opportunity to attend, uh, Nuno and his musical talents and his wonderful spirit for God, uh, he was such a blessing to us this week, Lord. And as we close our revival, we uh, ask that you would uh, write your uh, laws, your concepts on our hearts uh, for consideration, Lord, during the days to come. We pray for, Lord, each household that's represented here today, that, God, you would extend your favor on them, not only today, but in the days to come, Father. And as we go uh, next door, we uh, ask you would bless the food, bless our time of fellowship together, and Father, give us uh, safety if we get the opportunity to have the hayride, for we give, give you the praise for all these things, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.